hey gamers this is liz davidson from beyond solitaire and this week on the podcast i have a very special guest adeline rizzo she's not a board game specialist she is an artist and she also works on jigsaw puzzles which i love very much but first adeline tell us about your uh, tell us about yourself as an artist before we get to the puzzles oh god uh fun place to start um I guess I am technically a painter, if we're um, speaking in these terms. Um, I have always, always wanted to make images since I was really young. Um, I went through many different institutions where I trained in different ways and, uh, you know, worked with different artists to kind of pick up their own styles and whatnot. But um, I've always had an affinity for classical realism and studying the old masters. And it was uh, very hard to find that in America at the time. And uh, I moved to Florence, Italy and um, went to the Florence Academy of Art, a very impressive institution that's very, you know, all bolstered up in all of their ways and uh, trained there um, for a number of years, uh, graduated, started you know, producing my own work outside of it and then got sucked up into a puzzle company in the middle of it. Um, yeah, that's pretty much how uh, the very short version of uh, the art career thus far. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you had an exhibit this past weekend. Oh, I did. No, I am. Um, my one of my paintings was accepted to the uh, Woodmere Art Museum as a art museum right outside of the Philly area. It's technically in Philadelphia, I guess, if you think about it that way, but a beautiful museum, and um, they do their annual juried exhibition, and this this year's theme was seeing the story, so giving a place for narrative art to have a platform in the modern world, which is um, not quite popular in the big institutions right now, so um, me as a, a realist who likes to tell stories um, in a representational way with paintings, um, there was a place for me there, so I got to hang a painting there. So a first museum show is a good thing, I guess. Yeah. Beautiful. So puzzles, is that something that you were always interested in? Or did you end up doing jigsaw puzzles by accident as an adult? Oh, no, no. Uh, it was, uh, <laughs> it's my mother, really, truly, at the end of the day. I run this puzzle company with my mom. She has many, many sisters, comes from a very big family, and she would always do jigsaw puzzles around the table. You know, we'd go to the lake for, you know, a couple days in the summer as vacation, and everybody would be able to catch up and talk around the jigsaw puzzle. And so for her, it was, it was a, a family oriented experience. And me, I was always kind of the teenager off in the distance who had absolutely zero interest in the jigsaw puzzle at all. I was mostly just trying to get out of as quickly as possible, as most uh, teenagers were um, at that point. But no, uh, after a certain amount of years, she basically started to realize that there was uh, no art that she wanted to do. No, She was struggling so hard to find a jigsaw puzzle that inspired her, especially because I was off studying and you know, I was uh, bringing them to art exhibits and talking about um, these new movements in art that I was able to witness. Uh, and she, as she was learning more about art, she was like, oh my God, I can't, I can't, if I do one more, you know, hot air balloons and puppies jigsaw puzzle, like I'm going to lose my mind. So <laughs> she basically, um, out of the blue, after running her own business, started a jigsaw puzzle company. Um, and I was at the, at the time finishing up, uh, my training at the academy in Italy and um, and wasn't really expecting to get involved. Um, but then suddenly um, I, I moved back home and uh, she did need some help, graphic design, these types of things. And so I would, I would help her in the small bits. And then suddenly I got unbelievably invested in a way that I would have never expected. And so now I am doing my first jigsaw puzzles Literally this year, I am I am experiencing their benefits for the first time. So I'm incredibly <laughs> new to the game. <laughs> so I find this funny. So full disclosure for those of you who are listening to my podcast, I did a positive review of puzzles from this company. So I already like them. Uh, these are puzzles from Art and Fable. And there's a certain level of luxury to the puzzles that y'all produce. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? The thought behind like the velvety pieces? Oh. The luxury. Um, 
you know, a modern take on old fashioned luxuries, right? Uh, for us, we wanted to make the highest quality product physically out there. So it was a lot of testing. It was a lot of um, research, but you know, there's nothing worse than a bad quality puzzle. Puzzle dust, oh, people hate it. You know, pieces that don't fit together well, pieces that, you know, there's a there's something to having an incredibly high quality product because you're it's a tactile experience. For the velvet touch in particular, we do this thing where there's a, a soft touch um, surface on all of our puzzles, right? So that does a couple things. It for me in particular, it eliminates all glare. So you can do a puzzle under any sort of lighting, especially at night, especially you know, people who are older, you know, who have to like look at the pieces in a particular way to see their true color. And as a painter, especially, there's nothing worse. There's a painter's worst enemy is glare, especially in a dark piece. So you can have these lush, wonderful, beautiful colors. Um, and none of it's sacrificed by light effect or anything like that. So uh, you're really, you're really experiencing it as a, you know, as a true piece of art in that way. And then also it's just incredibly soft unbelievably soft um in a way that um is a is a very sensory beautiful tactile experience i mean you know puzzlers if you know you know the once you complete a puzzle and you put every single piece together i don't know a single puzzler that doesn't run their hands over the entire thing that's their victory moments their victory lap like oh look what i've completed you know you, you have to do the puzzle rub after you finish the puzzle and also people who have not helped you with the puzzle come over and rub the puzzle because my boyfriend does that <laughs> there's there's a human inclination to like run your hand over that yeah. completed image humans need to touch you know it's uh it's a really important thing people talk about puzzles as this incredible vision you know obviously it's an incredible visual thing and a mind game thing and uh but it's a tactile experience um which is something that people don't always uh, bring to light with the jigsaw puzzle there's a reason that they're so effective and so addictive you know and so wonderful to do as a as a state of play you know um and the touch is part of it you know as many sensory experiences as we can include in the interactive experience that's good i mean we haven't started scenting the puzzles yet that would be a whole different thing but, i'm not sure i'm ready for that <laughs> no no, no. I mean, I don't know how you do that uh, say like a uh you know like the puzzle that you did that you were re oh, yes, the, the roses of helio Gabalis. yes like mm, you can do a puzzle of people suffocating yeah. under roses yeah. and smell the roses <laughs> i know i mean well, Emperor truly did actually, you know, the, as legend have it, kill a bunch of his uh, party guests. Um, With violets, apparently, according to the original account. But no. Uh, it's a very modern academic. It's not actually roses. The yeah. Just take their, uh, <laughs> artistic liberties, right? Maybe, <laughs> maybe he wanted to paint paint. Who knows? I'm a believer in artistic liberties, uh, but also unusual artistic themes. I really enjoy like a good puzzle on sort of a reinterpretation of something classical and that's actually really hard to find so this is where you come in you are the curator for the art for these puzzles and is that something that you had to learn how to do on top of the art that you already know how to create yourself oh no um it is it is much harder to create your own art than be very adamant about how much you love other people's art <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, any, any painter who gets into anything, they have their heroes, they have their masters, they have this thing that they want to do more than anything in the world, which is this unachievable, beautiful, you look at the masters, you look at these other painters, and you're like, how, how could they possibly do it? And you're seeing they're not getting the attention. No, no, um, uh, putting my taste upon the world came very naturally. <laughs> 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 Um, no, it came very naturally. Uh, there are some parts of it that got more complicated because, you know, if you're a curator for a gallery, um, you know, that's, um, well-funded and you have a good base, you can pretty much do what you want. You can, you can hang the paintings you want. You can put the sculptures in that you want and, uh, your taste is not to be questioned. Um, with puzzles, it's a whole different, whole different scenario, uh, because my taste uh, in painting uh, tends to lean 
more towards the classical, the Baroque, the, um, you know, the, the, the French, you know, new wave, like these types of paintings tend to have one singular glowing body or subject um, and in, a, in a field of darkness. You know, it's something that artists use is, um, you know, is contrast and uh, light isolation as a way to, you know, have the viewer focus particularly on one absolutely stunning thing in the middle of the painting. Um, for a puzzle, these types of works do not, do not, nor do they sell or nor are they fun to do as puzzles. Um, because then you're dealing with one one light object or one colorful object and um, tons of blackness in the distance. And you're just putting, you know, the darkness pieces together and that's your whole puzzle and it's torture. So, I mean, some people like to do it. The really hardcore puzzlers are like, give me a gradient. Let's flip the whole puzzle over and I'll do it backwards and not look at the image, you know. But for lots of people, they want detail. They want color isolation. Um things happening that they can recognize in a certain piece and go, oh, this is what's happening here. I'll place it here. Oh, this color only happens in this one spot. Okay, I know where that goes. And so it's a decoding thing for them that they can do where it's rewarding enough that they're not going to abandon the piece or not engage with it. And that's the whole point is to engage with the piece. Well, at least for me, the whole point is to engage with the piece. But <laughs> um, but yeah, to, to not lose hope in um, in doing a puzzle, you have to have something to attach to. So, you know, the kind of art that I might be interested in um, may not may not serve for the general public. So we look for color. We look for we look for lines, something that you can trace from one piece to the next. Um, we would do puzzles with uh, with text in it, like old story books. We would compile these things so you can put together the words alongside with the images. Something that you can humans can attach to and feel proud of because that's the whole thing you once when you get a piece that's the moment that's um the spark and that's what keeps you going with it right so yeah complicated <laughs> but that's a good thing so yeah. i like what you're talking about with engagement something to feel attached to something maybe to feel anchored by um do you think that puzzles offer an opportunity to engage with art that's something different from what you can get from looking at a painting in a museum for a long time oh absolutely absolutely this is a something that we've been thinking about for a long time and haven't quite had the chance to or had the platform to really talk to people about but after a certain amount of research and doing a certain amount of puzzles um we found that jigsaw puzzles the classic cardboard jigsaw puzzle might be a really surprising and possibly the most effective way to get people interested in art again in a way that is very, very different from being in a museum. So there's this great study that came out um, a bunch of years ago about the average amount of time that people spend in front of a painting in a museum. And after watching watching people engage and, and seeing uh, you know, how they would interact with it, uh, 15 to 30 seconds in front of a piece at a museum on average. And, uh, you know, this is, you know, when people are just walking by, you know, maybe there's an art student that stands in front of a painting for an hour, but really most people, 15 to 30 seconds. And a jigsaw puzzle requires so much more time and so much more focus in a way where not only is it about the time invested, but you are analyzing colors, you are analyzing shapes, you are analyzing brush strokes, composition, decisions you have to in order to get the puzzle done you have to step inside the mind of the painter and completely rethink how this piece was put together why was that decision made why does this go over here it is so different i mean most people even even very intense art students people who are obsessed with painting they you know spend time online looking at a painting you know on the computer even museums are are trying desperately desperately, desperately to get the public engaged in art in a way um, that hasn't really been the case for a hundred years or so. Um, and they're doing things like, uh, you know, virtual reality exhibitions or they're, um, you know, different apps you can get on your phone to guide you through the museum and, or, oh, for Christ's sake, making 
making all of their classical art into memes on social media. This has been the new thing, you know? And so they're, they're desperate, desperate to find ways to get the public to care about, um, about the art of painting again. And, um, Puzzles might be something that is, you know, it's a non-technological experience. You're doing it with your hands. Like you said, the tactile thing, the, it, it awakes so many different um, sections of the brain in order to go through it. And um, no, there's, there's so many different ways, so many, uh, so many different reasons on why this might be a really effective tool for both, I think, art educators would be very into this if you're you know teaching like a high school or history class how do you get a a 15 year old to care about a piece of art or really look at it for more than five seconds on the powerpoint you know um this might be a really incredible tool and and artists need it in order for there to be for there to be um, an audience really for painters in the future uh we need to have the public just exposed to it um you know, for the most part. And so, you know, because if we think about living painters, there are very few venues for them to showcase their work in a meaningful way. There's galleries, there's museums, there's, I mean, Instagram, Facebook, all of these things. Um, there's uh, publications that will feature their work. But, but other than that, um, there's no other way that their work is being distributed around the world. Um, and puzzles, puzzles is a way to do that, a really effective way, because people are actually engaged. They're not just flipping through a magazine and reading a little blurb if they even care to look at it for more than a second. They have to really, really engage. And, and um, yeah, I don't see any other, any other thing in the world right now that might hold that potential. Um, yes. So I have a rude slash difficult question, but take a cut. So, okay, this is something that people ask me all the time because I'm a Latin teacher. You know, I'm a great lover of things that maybe people don't see the value in right away. Yeah. So, you know, when you talk about wanting people to appreciate art again and the fact that that's fading, why shouldn't we let it fade? What is the value that we should be getting from all these modern painters that maybe we ignore too much? Okay, so there's the answer. So I think about something like Latin, right? Uh, the Latin language, the ancient languages. They're not the, perhaps the most efficient mode of communication uh, for the modern world. Yes, which is part of the reason perhaps it died out. But you are fighting to keep it alive uh, with what you do, yes? Painting in itself as an art form is completely, it's anti-efficiency absolutely anti-efficiency. There would be a thousand ways to communicate similar ideas in ways that take a lot less time, a lot less money, a lot less resources, all of these things. Um, the movies, the, you know, digital art is, is coming about in a huge way right now. But I think that slowing down and doing things the hard way really do have an effect that is long lasting in a way that we as the the human race needs this. We need to be able to breathe, take a moment, and 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 go through the steps um, that perhaps we've gotten quite used to skipping. And maybe there's something beautiful. I mean, a puzzle in itself is an anti-efficient act. You know, it is not it is not easy. It is not the quickest way to see that image at the end of the day. But we take joy in it, and we learn something. Um, through the painstaking steps of putting it together, I absolutely think there is value, absolute value in keeping painting as a, in the old way, um, alive. It, if anything else, it connects us to our physical world. We're not looking at a piece of art done on the computer. We're not looking at um, something even shot through. We're looking at every single drop of blood and sweat that another human being put into this physical object that means so much to to them it means so much to you know this is what we share our lives in this physical world and if we abandon that too quickly no i i, I do believe that there is a there is something lost there if we do not keep it alive even a little bit 
And I think it's really interesting that you're talking a lot about sort of the development of expertise and the amount of time that goes in and the amount of resources that go in. However, when you're talking about puzzles, you're also giving people a chance to get a taste without necessarily being an expert, without necessarily putting in all of those hours. But also with great power comes great responsibility. You know, how are you choosing what art you want to show to just a person who maybe wants to do a really cool jigsaw puzzle that feels velvety soft, you know, I mean, what kind of thought goes in to those choices beyond this would make a good puzzle. What are you trying to communicate to people who may not be artists, but who might like the image you pick? Well, I mean, that's the whole point, right? There's this whole conversation around, um, appreciating art or painting as a pastime for the elite for the rich or for the educated and um i mean the art world you know put themselves in their own hole with that for sure but (laughs) for sure they did but i think that society is losing something so big if it's not shared with everybody that's the other beautiful thing about a puzzle is that you can buy that puzzle for you know under thirty dollars and you know you might not be able to go into the city go to a gallery all these things um but choosing choosing art for the general public i look at you know i've done a lot of you know asking people asking friends who might not be artistically inclined like what do you like oh does this you know do you react to this do you react to that what about the color what about this expression this texture of paint what what do you what do you love about this what do you hate about this and it's so varied and so hard to make decisions in this manner but i think that people generally want want to do something beautiful they want to do something beautiful so and of course what does that mean um is a constantly (laughs) difficult uh question to answer but i i think that uh, you know, beautiful scenes of nature, um, beautiful scenes of of figures, uh, different color combinations. That there's something inherently in us as humans that we react to. I try and pay attention to that as much as I can. And also, also the the customers tell me, I don't know, I'm shooting in the dark. So we might release a collection thinking, oh, this one's going to be incredibly popular. The puzzlers are going to love this. The, these people are going to love this. It's going to, you know, it's going to do so well. And then, it, and then it's a dud. And then we release another one that we think, you know, maybe serving this purpose, maybe, you know, that perhaps we didn't have as much faith in to be something that really united a bunch of people. Next thing you know, people are sending us messages from all around the world being like, I can't believe this piece. I love this artist. I'm following him. It's, I'm thinking about all these different things, which is, it's a guessing game. I would love to say uh, that there is a science that at least I can under, I can't understand. The science. I, you know, there's studies being done at Yale in these labs on how people perceive artworks, you know, and how, you know, what happens in the brain when you see this and when you see that. I don't know. None of us know. We can try to guess, but learning from the puzzlers has been a huge experience, an absolutely huge experience. Is you you decide what is beautiful. I just get to throw things at you <laughs> that I think maybe maybe this will make someone's world. Maybe this will, you know, maybe this will be something that they truly treasure or they learn something from or learn something new about themselves that they didn't know, you know, through this piece. It's just a guess. (laughs) Have you found yourself looking at artists or different styles of art more closely as a response to interest from puzzlers? Like maybe there was something that you thought was fine, but then you were like, wait a minute, maybe I should do a double take because people really seem to like this. Oh my God, absolutely. Absolutely, without a doubt. Again, I come from a very specific artistic background where the you know the academy says this painter knew what they were doing and this painter had no idea what they were doing. It's a very competitive situation and they are nasty. Painters are nasty, truly, truly nasty, and very, very, very opinionated. <laughs> Everyone should know that. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is incredibly true. And so, no, I was formed into my opinions steadfast you know, very, very, very unwilling to step outside of my stylistic things and, you know, aesthetic decisions. And, oh, I've had 
a zillion surprises, a zillion surprises, whether it be, I mean, we have these, um, these artists that are, you know, working the more, you know, folk art way or artists that have, um, you know, just incredibly huge stylistic differences for me. Uh, we have more like psychedelic artists that I, I just cannot believe I'm looking at this work and I, I can't believe it. Oh, this is a great example. One of our, our top artists, top selling artists that puzzlers just, oh my God, they go nuts for. Her name is Betsy Silverman. And I swear she's one of the greatest realists alive today. And she doesn't pick up a paintbrush at all. She takes magazine clippings and it, it's all collage. So she creates this, these incredible cityscapes, these landscapes that if you step back from them, you know exactly what you're looking at. It is realism at its forefront. And you are, and you zoom in and it's made of all these Mod Podge, beautiful little clippings from magazines, from different things. There's words in there. There's like advertisements. It's phenomenal. What she does is mind blowing. And you know, three years ago in my studio mixing my paints, I would have never thought that I'd be overwhelmingly excited to see every new piece that this collage artist comes up with because it's phenomenal. Phenomenal. That's a great example. Betsy Silverman, my God. She's great. <laughs> True Boston, unbelievable, visionary artist. I would have never known. So are there any artists or styles or collections that you would like to bring to an art and fable collection that you just haven't been able to do yet? Like what is your dream future project? Oh my God. I mean, every day I think about these things, 10,000 answers. Um, for me, it's, I would love nothing more to use my platform with jigsaw puzzles to bring light to these new movements happening in contemporary realism. There are phenomenal painters out there who have studied and worked so hard and they are doing work that most people thought was completely forgotten, completely forgotten. Unbelievable. The skill involved, the beauty involved, putting it in these modern contexts. These people are rock stars and no one knows they exist so, at all. Real quick, by realism, I'm assuming you mean something that looks like a, sort of a photorealistic renaissance-y look, but well, in the modern era? Kind of. So photorealism <laughs> is different. Hyperrealism, Hyper photorealism. Yeah. Um, this is different than something like classical realism, figurative realism, representational. We're getting nerdy with labels here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's It's difficult. Um, hyperrealism um, is work done primarily from photographs that looks exactly like the photograph. And there's, it's very impressive, very impressive the way these things are being done. I'm talking about um, the world of figurative realism, perhaps, that is, it's got a lot more expression and soul in the way that the paint is applied um it's looser more imaginative it's it's less tight like you know like a robot could probably paint hyper realist paintings you know but the, the figurative uh realist movement is um there's texture there's passion there's mistakes there's you know this blood in it that is so beautiful and and these painters train for years and years and years and this movement is growing let me put it this way so um, the academy that I went to was one of the first to pop up in, I guess it was, you know, the late 90s, early, you know, 2000s that was reviving these old, uh, these old techniques from the masters um, because at the time, the 80s, you know, it was, we had moved really far. It, it, any sort of um, realist representational art had fallen out of favor so drastically and the art school stopped teaching it, all of this and um, the the information was almost forgotten, almost completely forgotten. And um, a couple of people in Florence really are credited with uh, with bringing this information back to light and training a whole new generation of painters again to be able to paint a portrait, be able to paint the figure beautifully, you know. And um, there is this whole movement of painters coming out of these academies, doing things that are so phenomenal. Um, and now these academies are all around the world. They're popping up everywhere. It's happening. And I would love nothing more than to work with, uh, there's these curators, a husband and wife, uh, they're called the Bennetts. And they work with only female figurative 
realist painters painting work of the female body of women and they're doing absolutely incredible things for the movement i would love oh my god painters like uh, rebecca laville oh my gosh she's an unbelievable rock star brad kunkel is doing these giant you know, paintings with gold leaf and these figures coming out. I mean, it's unbelievable work, unbelievable work that someone's got to talk about it. Someone has to give it a platform. And I would love nothing more than to team up with some of these people um, to, you know, to push their work around the world. I want to put their work around the world in the hands of people and their families that perhaps have no idea that this work is being made, that could change the way um, people think about this whole section of art. So yeah, that's what I would like to do. Figurative realism, the rock stars, <laughs> the rock stars need a place to be. I want them to be considered like, like, like the movie stars, like the actors, you know, that are all over People Magazine that are, you know, I, I always think about this example. This is the classic example that if you ask, go out on the street and if you, pull a random person over and you're like what's your favorite song what's your favorite band what's your favorite musician they'd go oh my god i have so many all right let me go through there's this one there's this one this one or definitely this song or what's your favorite movie who's your favorite actor well, there's all this passion they can you know there's so much for them to say and if you ask that same person what's your favorite painting there's this a lot of the time, unless they're um, passionate about it, uh, this kind of awkward silence um, where they try and fight for uh, that field trip they took in sixth grade, you know, and, and you know, God, what was the name of that painting? Or, and God forbid you ask, who's your favorite living painter? Ooh, if they don't bring up like their neighbor who paints, you know, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty hard for them to come up with something. So that's the culture. And it used to not be that way. We have the opportunity to change that with jigsaw puzzles, with actual engagement, possibly, hopefully, fingers crossed. <laughs> so yeah. we also talk about, uh, you know, when, when people talk about artists, I think the word starving is usually put in front of it. Um, so oh, yeah. the other question I have is, so as a business, you know, Art and Fable, it is about bringing art to a wider audience, but it's also about, you know, being a successful business and i think that i guess what i was wondering is do jigsaw puzzles also provide artists with an advantageous way to get their work seen and to profit from the work that they're creating oh yeah absolutely i mean for us personally we we do a direct licensing fee we do it again after we sell a certain amount of puzzles i mean what what we are truly selling to the artists and what we really want to do for the artists is be a platform for exposure. Artists work so hard for exposure. Exposure is all that they have. I mean, me as a painter too. I mean, I, you know, anything that I can do to put my work anywhere and just for it to be seen is incredible. That's all painters can ask for a lot of the time, just that it's being seen, let alone it being engaged with and like examined in an intense way, like a puzzler. Oh, painters, painters would die. I would die to have somebody take like a piece that I was really proud of and examine it in the way that you would have to in order to do it as a jigsaw puzzle. Painters usually are very used to not asking for that because they think it's impossible. Like, well, you know, it's impossible. So no, um, really it was what we were doing is uh, expanding audience because again, not everybody can afford to buy a painting, but maybe somebody can. Maybe a one of those couple thousand puzzles that we are sending out into the world, maybe that person's uncle sees it and he has the ability and he falls in love with it and he goes and contacts that painter and buys that piece. Or just, I mean, we're living in the social media age where everything is how much you're being talked about, how many people are following you, how many people are whatever. We are giving painters or people the opportunity to go and look further. That's why we include with every single puzzle, like, yes, there's the, there's the puzzle, the resealable bag, we little box top stand, all of this, but we include a print, like a really, really nice print of the artwork where you flip it around and there's a whole biography of the painter. Ideally in the future, I'd love to 
go further with that, but the details about the piece. Um, I would love to, soon we're going to have a new website maybe where we have a whole blog format where I can do these more long-winded uh, exhibitions of the artist's work, interviews with the painters. It's all about empathy, 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 empathy. If, if someone who doesn't realize they love art, right, can go and learn about this painter, hear them talk, hear them talk about their own experience, that creates the love and respect necessary uh, for them to have a really excited audience and to do well in the long term. Without that, it's impossible. They can be very famous in their like exclusive art communities, they can have gallery representation, but there's only, only a very small percentage of the world goes to these galleries and, you know, sees these online exhibitions and, you know, we can just widen or break it open to the average person and everyone can win. That's my plan with that. So yeah, I would like to think that I'm doing something for the painters, or at least I will try to every single day moving forward to come up with new ways to make that happen. That's the goal at the end of the day. That's the heart of it. So how, so you mentioned that your engagement with jigsaw puzzles is something that, I mean, you, you knew about them for a long time, but maybe only recently really started doing them. So has that had any impact on your own art? Does engaging through puzzles affect your work in any way? Oh, I, I absolutely think so. I mean, I mean, well, let me put it this way. Definitely curating uh, for a puzzle company has impacted the way I think about my own painting um, in a in a very intense way. Um, just being exposed to so many different kinds of art that perhaps I was not before in my little bubble. Um, but you know, I think about there's this puzzle that we make. It's called uh, it's called the Reply of the Cossacks. It's a very 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 famous painting by Ilya Repin. So he was, you know, I think he died in like 1930 something. But, you know, big, turn of the century, important, like the Russian academic. I mean, you know, if you're going to go study art, there's a couple places to do it. There's Florence, there's London, da, da, da. Russia, St. Peter's, but the academy is called the Ilya Repin Academy. The Repin Academy, he is the king for, for, for Russian painting in many ways. Um, and I, when I was at the academy, I went to a lecture uh, that featured this painting, The Reply of the Cossacks. I learned everything about it. They're zooming up on the little, you know, learning the history and why it's important and the way, you know, that the heads are turned and the way he built, uh, the, you know, built the bodies with, um, you know, the Russian academic method, which is a more connective painting method. So I learned, it was an hour lecture on this singular painting. And I came out of it, oh, I love it. Oh, you know, like I know this painting so well, right? I've learned so much about it. And, uh, and it, you know, the time came where um, we made it into a puzzle because um, it's got a great story as well. It's, um, you know, the Cossacks have just uh, received a letter from uh, the Turkish Sultan, I think. And uh, the Sultan is asking their army to back down, to surrender, you know, surrender now. And the, and the Cossack army um, is in the painting. They're laughing. They're, <laughs> they're losing their minds laughing. Uh, composing a response letter that's taunting the sultan, like, come and get it. So it's a very funny painting in, in the historical context, the subject, fantastic. But so it wasn't until we got that puzzle finally, the shipment came, we had made it, where I was putting it together. And there was 10,000 things about the painting I had never noticed before. And I had literally been to lectures on this painting and spent months looking at it at full detail and analyzing it for all of its different reasons. And I, there were discoveries about it I would have never made, never made without literally doing the puzzle itself, which is, that was the click moment. Like me as an obsessive painting person, I don't need to be convinced. I was someone who didn't need to be convinced. I didn't need to learn more about it in my mind. And um, the jigsaw puzzle, the act of doing it, um, changed everything about the way I, I looked at the painting. So yeah, that was, a I guess, a big light bulb moment in that sense. So it does change things. Yeah. So I have one more question for, for you that actually springs from a thing you said earlier in our conversation, but also I love the way that you talked about the story 
of the painting that you know that we were just talking about the, the the reply of the Cossacks, and you know you mentioned earlier that you found a place for a painting of yours that was basically visual narrative. I've interviewed people a lot about narrative in board games, but wow. how do you express narrative in a static image? Oh, fantastic question. Um, oh, my professors are listening. I am so sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how do you express narrative in a static image? So there are, talk about the lessons of the past that were almost forgotten. And again, I barely made it through academia. If I did it all, <laughs> that needs to be a pretense. There are many, many, many different ways of doing that, which is why um, using figure in realism is so important. So we oh got so many different topics here. So everything from a face can tell a story, the way someone holds their body can tell a story, little movements of the hand, little movements of the eye. I mean, a very you know important way that the old masters used to do it was uh, the direction of the eyes of, um, of people in the painting. One person, if your eye goes here to the subject at first, and then that subject might be looking at another subject in the painting that's over here, and that might tell a different part of the story. And that person's eyes go over here, and that tells a different part of the story, and then it circles back to Venus or something, you know, that uh, can tell the backstory there. That's one way. The other way of doing that with a static image is um, is uh, value compression is a is a tool that painters use where the ideas around value compression are basically that okay so you have a glowing thing in the front of your painting right and it's taking over so much light and it's emanating and it's it's what you see your eyes go straight for it right and then your eyes take some time to adjust, kind of like when you go out in the night and you, you know, the outdoor light is really bright and you have to take time to see the rest of what's in the darkness. Um, when you go over to other parts of the painting, what you may have considered was just darkness in the background or a neutral color in the background. There are stories being told, there's figures in the back, there are things happening there. So there, are, it, it plays with time in that level. So it takes one second for a person to see that first thing that the painter wants them to see, and then maybe three or four or five or 10 more seconds to see what's happening maybe in the background. And then, you know, 30 more seconds, 40 more seconds, you see something that's so compressed into the background, into the darkness, but there's still an event happening, a story being told. So this is, because stories need to be told throughout time, right? Like we were talking earlier about classics, about Homer, right? Stories were always told, um, you know, uh, around a fire. They were uh, word of mouth. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, oh, they were told orally. There yes. we go. Um, <laughs> so that happens over a piece of time. Um, and that's why music has such a leg up in a way, because music can play with time. They can say one thing first, the other thing next. And, and there can be a reveal or a conclusion, like the end of a fable, like the end of a of a moral story, whatever. Um, humans like stories. Humans uh, humans really like the idea of uh, step one, step two, and then the reveal. You know, uh, there, there's something in our brains that uh, works that way. It's the way we evolve. In, in, or I think, again, I'm talking to the PhD about that, so I don't really know. But I, I truly believe that human brains work like this. You know, the Joseph Campbell idea, all of this. So, so yeah, um, storytelling in art is really important, which is actually brings me to another part of the puzzle company. The reason that we're called Art and Fable, um, instead of just, you know, we love art. Art, <laughs> art puzzle company. Yes, that would have been fun. <laughs> Great name. Oh God, we would have been so close to that. Um, but the, the fable side of it is this uh, the storytelling. So my mother and I were very passionate about Golden Age illustration, um, illustrators like Kim Nielsen or um, Walter Cl Crane. And these are storytellers. You know, illustration back in the day was the art of storytelling visually. I mean, representational art was the art of storytelling visually. You look back to, you know, the church and all of these things that 
how do, okay, so 98% of our uh, world is illiterate. How do we tell the stories, <clears throat> our old religious stories? Let's do it visually. Let's do these incredible paintings. Let's evolve to be able to communicate visually with people, right? Um, and so that's part of the art and fable thing. We wanted to be able to tell stories with the art that we put forward. So, uh, yeah, we, we have some incredible like Nordic tales and stuff like that, you know. Uh, you can put together the words in certain parts. Yeah, anything to be able to engage in a longer lasting um, experience. Um, and literature and storytelling is just as relevant as painting will ever be. They're hand in hand. So, so yeah, we wanted to, wanted to cover all bases with that one, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't know a lot about art and you just want to start with something, is it a reasonable starting place to just look for a puzzle that has an image that speaks to you and just do it and then learn about that image? Yes. 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 That's a perfect way to do it. An absolute perfect way to do it. Cause you could, you could do it other ways. You could go to a class and then that costs money and all the stuff and the time and the things. No, you could look it up on the internet. And then next thing you know, you're at a website that's like, okay, the entire history of art and Oh, do you like a landscape? Here's 10,000 types of landscape and then 10,000. No, you're going into a black hole where nothing ever gets done. Or, you know, if you go into a gallery, even sometimes, you know, you might not be connecting with something. Go search for a puzzle and put it together and look. I guess that's my biggest piece of advice. If you're not into art, find out if you're not into art. You know, if you if you don't explore it, you'll never know. So this is a really wonderful opportunity where it's a game. You're playing. There's, a, you know, there's no loss there to just find out, to learn about yourself um, with doing it. So yeah, find an image like, oh, I like that for whatever. You can be like, I have no idea why I like that image. Don't overanalyze that at all. Take it home and, and just just pay attention to it, you know? Pay attention to, you know, the little shifts in value or color or look at the artist's signature and how they had to place it on top of something that they maybe like worked really hard on before or you know, or how like a face is constructed or, I mean, I'm, I'm talking as a painter again, how a face is constructed. Just look at the colors, you know, look at, look at whatever you want to look at in it. Cause you're going to discover something that nobody else is going to discover. And it's going to be completely personal. And that's the beauty of art. In the, and it's intimate. You can do that puzzle by yourself. It's, you know, it's like going to see the Mona Lisa, but for an audience of one, you know, you get to do that. So yeah, don't, yeah, go, just go do a puzzle. Much easier, much more fun, much more fun. And um, yeah, I guess that's, yeah, go do a puzzle. <laughs> I think this is a great moment to ask. So where can you be found on the internet? Oh God, <laughs> well, uh, I am found with the company. The company is very easily found. Art and Fable Puzzle Company.com is our website. We have an Instagram, Art and Fable Puzzles. And is that pretty much it? We have a Facebook, Art and Fable Puzzle Company. Um, one day we'll have a YouTube, maybe. One day when we're blogging, we'll be doing articles. So, you know, stay up to date on that. And uh, and for me as a painter, um, yeah, my name is Adeline Rizzo. Um, very hard to spell, so you're going to have to figure that out for yourself. And my Instagram and my website, that will... Maybe that's a clickable thing later. It's um, in the show title. <laughs> it's in the show title. <laughs> we got you. <laughs> Google that and painter. Something will probably come up. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much, Adeline, for coming on. Uh, for those of you who, uh, I mean, if you're listening to this podcast, you know, I can be found anywhere as Beyond <laughs> Solitaire. So thank you so much, Adeline. I really appreciate the time you took to be on the show. Thank you. Thank you for taking a chance on a crazy art puzzle person who doesn't know how to talk. We're very appreciative. <laughs> Went fine to me. All right. So everybody who's listening, if you have questions, comments, let us know. And uh, most of all, happy gaming, or in this case, happy puzzling. <laughs>